Rob conducts research and extension related to aquatic plant management at North Carolina State University. He is a past president of the Aquatic Plant Management Society and past editor of the Journal of Aquatic Plant Management. He currently serves as a board member um, for the Weed Science Society of America and a subject matter expert to US EPA on aquatic plant management. And with that, um, turn it over to Rob to talk about successful aquatic plant management strategies. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just as an uh, introduction to the presentation, I uh, have an outline available here. Um, so I'll touch on a few different topics today um, and weave in some of those successful management uh, techniques that were mentioned in the title. Uh, first, I do want to set, uh, explain how to set goals for aquatic plant management projects. What are some of the steps that should be taken to be sure that you've gone through every consideration uh, for your, your management uh, situation. Uh, part of that is stressing the importance of vegetation surveys and the role that plant biology plays into implementing your management techniques. And I'll talk about those management techniques and give examples of successful implementation. Uh, of course, uh, you know, in the limits of a 45 minute presentation, we can't go through a ton of uh, successfully implemented management strategies, but I'll touch on just a few uh, that I find interesting and that hopefully you will as well. So what do we want to accomplish? Uh, you know, this is a question that should be asked as you approach every individual system. Uh, each system is going to be different. When you go from one water body to another, uh, you should not assume that you, they should be treated equally, uh, either in consideration for management or in the techniques that are implemented. Uh, part of the the backstory in working through this is, you know, determine the system parameters. What is the natural state of the system? In an ideal world, what would your water body be and how would it function? So if you have weeds or you expect to have weeds, um, will those weed species decrease the ecosystem quality? What are the potential impacts that they will have to the ecosystem and to the other species that are present? Uh, the other uh, main consideration here for a lot of our water bodies is the, the role of humans. So will those weeds decrease human satisfaction? Is the water body used for human recreation or uh, for property development, for fishing, uh, for human consumption? There, there's just a lot of different angles to consider there as well. And then how likely are new introductions? If you go out and you manage your weed species today, what's the likelihood that that same species or different species will be introduced next month, next year, and five years, uh, all that has to be considered uh, when you're setting your goals. So moving through making our uh, weed management decisions, you know, one of the things that we clearly want to define are all the uses of the body of water. A lot of our water bodies are multiple use. Are they used for irrigation? Are they used for human consumption, recreation? Again, are the shorelines developed? Uh, is it used for, uh, wildlife in any capacity? Is it for waterfowl hunting, fishing? Uh, all of those uh, potential uses come into play when you're trying to determine which management techniques might or might not be practical for the situation. Another big step here is plant identification. Uh, we need to understand what weed species we have, but we also have to understand what desirable species we might have in that system. Obviously, we would want to select management techniques that would reduce the population of the invasive species while uh, protecting uh, those native desirable species that we have. Is the water body used uh, for fish and wildlife populations? Do we want to maintain those? Um, how important are those fish and wildlife populations in the water body? And this can be very uh, distinct if you're talking about a small water body that might be used primarily for irrigation or a large water body that's used for human consumption and, and multi-purpose. Again, all of these factors can change when you go from one water body to another. What is the current water quality of the system and what, we, what do we want that water quality to be? Uh, we certainly don't want to do anything through management that would impair water quality or have negative impacts there. There are physical limitations to each site on what we might be able to do from a management standpoint, environmental limitations, and certainly we're always gonna have economic limitations and what we can afford to invest in management in that system. Uh, 
So all those considerations have to uh, be taken into account. Now, just some uh, of my own general thoughts as we start moving through this. There is no silver bullet or one size fits all approach to management. Again, each water body is gonna be different and each water body is probably gonna need its own uh, unique approach uh, in some capacity to management. So there might be some small changes to a management technique or you might end up using different management techniques when you go from one water body to another. Uh, again, each water body is distinct and each needs to be clearly defined. So what are the parameters that we're working with with this individual water body? Natural systems are more complex than impoundments. In the southeast U.S., we have a lot of uh, drinking water reservoirs. Uh, a lot of them were built for flood control, um, but they're not natural systems. They are impoundments and they're inherently artificial. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration when we're managing those as well. Uh, what are the goals? Our management techniques have to be able to accomplish those goals. Uh, if not, then they're not right for this certain scenario. A lot of times uh, we need to consider whether eradication is a reasonable goal or not. Um, if we promise eradication, uh, our clientele, stakeholders are going to expect eradication. And eradication can be very difficult to achieve in some systems. So it's very important to consider whether eradication is a realistic goal at this point in time, or maybe if we should just do management for a number of years to reduce the invasive uh, species population and then reevaluate whether we want to work towards eradication or just maintain uh, that invasive species at a really low population density. Technical advisory groups can be very helpful uh, with a lot of systems. There are a lot of steps that need to be taken to be sure that due diligence has been done in evaluating the management techniques and to ensure that the proper techniques are selected. So having the right technical experts uh, can help to serve in that capacity to be sure that you know, all the boxes are checked, all the steps have been uh, gone through and that the recommended uh, management strategy does meet the, the need of every component of that system. Now with a lot of systems, we also need to get public input before uh, implementing our management strategy. So many of our systems, again, have a high degree of public exposure, either through recreation or public drinking water, uh, any of those aspects, but it is important for them uh, to provide input on the proposed management strategy and uh, try to help them understand why those management techniques are being implemented. Uh, so that brings us to public outreach, so the explaining why uh, the techniques were selected, what we hope to accomplish with implementation of those techniques, and how we will monitor the system to decide if our management techniques are achieving our goals or not achieving our goals. Now, we certainly have uh, human complications to management. I've uh, mentioned some aspects of this in the preceding slides. Uh, but again, a lot of our water bodies are multiple use bodies of water, and this can mean that we have uh, different stakeholders with different opinions on how that system should be managed. Uh, our shoreline owners, the property owners along the side of a water body are going to have uh, one perception of how that system should serve them. Uh, recreational users, uh, your jet skiers or water skiers, jet boat users, um, they're going to have their own opinion on how that water body should serve them. Uh, if we have fishermen and duck hunters that utilize the system, obviously they're going to want to catch fish when they go fishing or see ducks when they go hunting. So that's going to be their perception. Uh, if the system is being used for power generation, uh, then we have to take that in consideration. We don't want weeds to clog turbines or interfere with power generation. And also for potable water, we have to protect that water resource and be sure that the water use is not compromised. Uh, you know, with everybody quarantined at home lately, they certainly need a reliable and safe supply of drinking water in order to stay at home. Uh, so that's a major consideration as well. Now, in a lot of systems, we can have multiple managers involved. Uh, a lot of times state agencies will have divisions in managing water resources. So you may have the state uh, fishery and wildlife agency that's in charge of uh, populations of game fish or rare species in the system. You may have a Department of Environmental Quality that's in charge of uh, drinking water, drinking water quality. Uh, you may have another state agency that has another responsibility out there, such as uh, noxious weed management. 
So each of those agencies would have their own role to play. And in many of these situations, no one of those agencies has overarching authority. So you have to bring all those agencies, those personnel together and have agreement, consensus on the strategy moving forward. Uh, so if, uh, a water body is used for hydro generation and you also have the generator, uh, either the private company or the Corps of Engineers or whoever would be in charge of that uh, generation station, uh, they would also be a manager. Uh, many, a time, many times our water bodies cross state lines, so then we have not only one set of state agencies, but two sets of state agencies that would have to come to agreement and be represented. Some water bodies also uh, may allow private individuals to have some management authority. So in uh, the case of, say, Lake Gaston, uh, property owners on the side of Lake Gaston may treat the water up to 100 feet uh, from the extension of the property line. So that has to be taken into account and be sure that uh, we don't double treat an area or that what the, the private individuals can potentially do fits within overarching, overarching goals of the system. And then there are natural complications to management. So we certainly have water bodies that have rare species or other species that we want to protect. So we can't do anything with our management programs that would deplete those populations. Uh, some species may have protected spawning seasons uh, where you cannot undertake any management activities during spawning. Other systems may have either high water flow or variable water flow, and all those can be challenges to management. Uh, rare submersed plants may be among the most difficult challenge because if we're talking about managing submersed weeds, uh, a rare submersed plant is going to be pretty, pretty closely related, both from an ecological standpoint, but maybe also from a botanical standpoint. So they may be quite sensitive to the typical management strategies that we would implement for a submersed weed. So we have to be uh, very cautious in those scenarios and again, be sure that our management techniques fit uh, the specific site that we're managing. Uh, so that brings us to lake vegetation surveys and again these are very important both for knowing the distribution of weed species in a water body but also what um, native or desirable species we might have in that system. Uh, this uh, example here is from uh, Roanoke Rapids Reservoir and uh, you can see uh, each one of those different colors would represent a different species composition, different mix, uh, the red color would be hydrilla alone, and say the pink color might be a mix of hydrilla and cabamba, while the green color might be a mix of Eurasian uh, milfoil, hydrilla, cabamba, and other species. But each color is a different composition of species. So you can see that there's multiple um, species composition sets within this one uh, reservoir. Now, most of our water bodies tend to be under monitored. Uh, in a lot of situations, vegetation surveys are only conducted after an invasive plant is confirmed. So we may not know what the vegetation history in the system is. What does quote unquote normal vegetation for that system look like? So we may be limited only to knowing what is there after uh, the weed was discovered and a full survey was done. Um, so we also need to know what plant populations we have, both from a species standpoint, but also from a biotype standpoint. We have different biotypes of many different species in the United States. Uh, one of the primary ones would be hydrilla. There is a dioecious biotype that's very common in the southeast and a monoecious biotype that's uh, common from North Carolina farther north. Uh, those biotypes can be different in how they behave. Uh, so you need to know what biotype you have in your system. We also have hybrid populations of some species, such as with milfoils. Uh, different hybrid populations can respond differently to, say, herbicide treatment. So it's really important to know exactly what we're dealing with as we start to establish our program. Uh, nutrient surveys, uh, again, you know, these should be taken into account, and often they're fairly limited in what has been done historically on a water body. Um, obviously, the more uh, nutrient data you have, the better off you are, and what you can collect in the future can certainly be helpful. Uh, bathymetric maps will exist for many systems, but those may be outdated. Uh, the bathymetry can change over time, either due to sediment uh, uh, deposition or erosion in some cases. In most systems, game fish are going to likely be the most monitored component of the system, 
usually there are set funds um, in each state for monitoring game fish populations. So those do tend to be surveyed far more, far more often than many other components of the system. So establishing goals for mapping lake vegetation, uh, ecological assessment, uh, is important. You want to establish a standard to support management techniques through evaluating invasion levels. So in other words, we need to know what we have now in order to know uh, whether the situation is getting worse or whether our management technique is improving the situation. So we want to define plant distribution and abundance, know where the plants are and uh, some level of how much of that plant we have in different uh, sections of our water body. Uh, quantify trends both spatially across the system, temporally across time, and understand the overall dynamics. So do you have one invasive plant species that is displacing other plants, or do you have multiple invasive plants that are coming into a system? Again, all this is going to feed into our um, uh, management techniques that, that might fit the site. And we want to be sure that our lake vegetation uh, mapping surveying is repeatable. Uh, so we want to be able to survey this year in 2020 and then do a survey in 2021 and be able to directly compare uh, one survey to another so that we can say that trends are valid. Um, if we change our management uh, or change our survey techniques too drastically, we may not be able to compare one year to another and say that uh, change, uh, an apparent change is a real change. Uh, so we do have some lim limitations to conventional mapping that should be considered when we start to uh, implement these programs. Um, if individuals are evaluating uh, or giving subjective evaluations, then that has to be taken into account. Um, estimation of uh, vegetation richness, estimations of uh, species abundance, uh, some of those can be subjective and uh, may not be reliable for year-to-year -year comparisons. Uh, many times our survey techniques are inefficient. We, the water bodies take a long time to uh, tra traverse. If you're going from point to point, uh, that does take quite a bit of labor or investment to do a detailed survey of each water body. Uh, so uh, we have to be sure that we sample enough points uh, to really know what's going on. But again, that does take uh, time and labor. Our survey techniques may also only gather one class of species. For instance, uh, you, if you're conducting a rake survey, you're going to be sampling for submersed vegetation. So your survey may only reliably capture the submersed vegetation that's in the system, and you may not be capturing emergent vegetation, such as say cattails or other marginal plants. That may or may not be important for management of the entire system, but it's a consideration so that the proper survey technique is selected. And again, due to the, the time and labor that can be needed for mapping, it can be costly and it can also require uh, a lot of post-processing depending on uh, how you're mapping or sensing those sites. Uh, so ground truthing, of course, is important to know what's out there that uh, does take time. Uh, you might be able to develop machine learning processes, but those also take time uh, to establish. Uh, this is a, an example of a point intercept survey on uh, Sharon Harris Lake in North Carolina. So you can see hopefully on the screen all the points that were selected for survey. Um, the points that had hydrilla are a light green and other surveyed points uh, with no hydrilla show up as black. And on the left would just be notes and uh, spreadsheet uh, for what was found or not found. Uh, and you can see one of the challenges you might have is if your water level drops, you may not be able to access a specific point that was previously accessible. Uh, this is an example of hydroacoustic sensing. Uh, this can be done with over-the-counter units like a low rance fish finder. Uh, and there's a system uh, set up for processing that data. Uh, but you can generate heat maps like you see on the left to represent uh, uh, high levels of uh, weed density with reds, very low levels of plant density with blue. So that can be very helpful in providing visuals to stakeholders and also managers about uh, what densities, what levels of, of vegetation you have in certain sites. And again, this is back to our SAV coverage in Roanoke Rapids Lake with the different 
uh, species compositions that are out there. And again, it's very important to know how many different uh, plant types you have uh, so that your management technique can be as selective as possible for the weedy species. And an example of a uh, bathymetry map with, using hydroacoustics, you can also get updated bathymetry for use with your management programs. Uh, just a few examples of density estimates that you might be able to generate uh, from surveys. Uh, this can be helpful again in refining your management program. Uh, here is an estimate for hydrilla. And move to uh, Kabamba. And this is a temporal estimate of hydrilla development, just to show uh, how species density might change within a given year. So hydrilla is a species that responds very rapidly to warm water. Once water in the system warms up, you can see enormous amounts of growth of hydrilla. And this is just a heat map representation of the same thing. Uh, red is high density and blues are low densities of uh, vegetation. So now as we move along, it's really important that we link plant biology to management. We want our management techniques to disrupt the biology of our target weeds. Uh, we want to interfere with reproduction to the greatest extent possible so that we deplete those uh, weedy populations over time. On the right, we've got a few images of hydrilla um, in North Carolina. That's one of our major weed species. Uh, but each weed species is going to have its own biological characteristics regarding growth, reproduction, etc. And again, we need to really attack uh, the biology of our target weed in order to have long-term impact. Management techniques need to reduce growth and interfere with reproduction. Uh, poor timing can make a good management technique fail. Uh, so our timing has to be right for the biology of the plant and uh, within the system as a whole. Uh, some tools that might look good in the short term may not hold up very year on a year to year basis. So we have to again select tools uh, that we expect to provide good long term benefit. Uh, so again, with hydrilla, it produces uh, turions, both axillary turions and subterranean turions that we often call tubers. And that's the main propagule of the plant. And it's the main reason why hydrilla is so difficult to manage once it gets into a system. Those turions can uh, remain, a certain percentage of those turions are going to re remain dormant. Uh, so they can persist for seven or more years in a system, meaning there is nothing that we can do to manage hydrilla and get rid of it in a single year. So we're talking about a long-term management program for hydrilla. Uh, by comparison, other species uh, that don't produce uh, propagules like that are far more easy, easier to manage. Uh, in the same plant family, we've got agaria and lacrosiphon. Uh, those plants may look similar to hydrilla, but they do not produce seed or turion, so they're much easier to manage. Uh, and again, understanding species biology is very important for targeting sensitive areas in the life cycle of that species. Now we'll move into some uh, general control categories and have some examples of uh, successful techniques that have been implemented. Um, so this chart, it's a little bit uh, complicated when you first look at it, but if you look on the left, as we go from top to bottom, we have different stages of invasion early invasion, mid invasion, late invasion, and then when the habitat is essentially saturated with our weed species. Different management techniques are going to be practical to different stages of invasion. Uh, for instance, with prevention, obviously you need to do prevention before you have uh, that weed in the system where it's just not gonna be effective. So prevention has to be done before you have your first introduction. Uh, hand weeding would typically be an option that's only for early invasion or, or low densities of plant populations. So uh, this chart just represents where each major management technique fits within the invasion cycle of weed growth in general. And we'll work through each of these management options in a little bit of detail. So prevention, uh, prevention uh, can be very economical if you're able to prevent those weeds from coming into your system. However, we're often too late with our prevention programs and we find a new weed, new invasive plant before we were able to imp implement prevention. Uh, here in the image, we've got hydrilla wrapped around a boat prop, and you can see it on the trailer. It's probably underneath uh, the boat as well. So if that boat goes to a different water body, uh, that hydrilla is going to be spread from one water body to another. That's a very common uh, 
means of spread for a lot of our aquatic plants since they spread so easily, typically through fragmentation. Uh, hand weeding is a very common management form worldwide. It's also very labor intensive and very inefficient. So it's usually for special situations with limited options or species that might be easily pulled. Uh, we also have taken into account that aquatic plants tend to be somewhere between 90 and 98% water by volume. So as you're pulling aquatic plants, most of what you're pulling out of the system is actually water. Uh, so it can, be, again, be quite inefficient. Uh, you, you can use divers to hand pull or suction dredge. Uh, that can be very precise, uh, but again, it's going to be slow. Uh, volunteers can be used in some areas, but um, volunteer use is going to be somewhat limited because there is liability with this. Again, we're talking about uh, an intensive labor operation, so uh, people may be susceptible to injury or risk of heart attack or stroke, so that may limit the pool of volunteers that can be used. Uh, aquatic plants can reproduce very quickly. Uh, in ideal conditions, uh, giant salvinia can double in uh, biomass in uh, less than three days. So uh, we can uh, try pulling some of these plants out, but a lot of them can reproduce about as fast as we can pull them out of the system. Uh, pulling fruited plants may also disturb the sediment and may also disturb uh, native species that are at that sediment layer. So that is a consideration as to, you know, is that practical or not practical for the system and the organisms that we have there. Um, mechanical techniques are also widely used. Uh, these are generally short term only. Uh, a way to kind of think of how these mechanical techniques would work is essentially like mowing your yard. Uh, you're going to take off a level of biomass of the plants that are there, but you're leaving the roots and a lower level of biomass behind. So what you leave behind can regrow. In many cases, it can re regrow uh, quite rapidly. Most aquatic plants also spread by fragmentation. So if we're in a system with limited uh, distribution of an invasive species and we start fragmenting it, uh, that can do more harm than good in many cases because those fragments can float off and form new infestations. Uh, mechanical techniques are going to generally be uh, non-selective in the target area, so they're going to pull out both weed species and native species. You're also going to have a certain level of bycatch with fish and turtles and whatever else might be in that plant material that you're pulling out as well. Mechanical techniques do require equipment access. You have to be able to get those in the, this image harvesters into the system, move them around the system, and then the material that you're harvesting, you have to have a plan to dispose of those plants that you're pulling out. So are you going to haul them away uh, from that work area, which uh, then you have additional expense from hauling, or are you going to have a dump pile within that system where all the harvested material goes? Uh, benthic barriers are uh, essentially a fabric barrier that you would lay across the sediment to block weed growth. So these can either be plastics or they can be a natural material such as a coconut fiber. Um, again, the goal is to prevent weeds from growing from the sediment up to the surface. So these can be uh, very effective where you put them right on top of the plants. Um, once you get sediment on top of these barriers, then the effectiveness decreases because then your weeds might just be able to reduce, uh, to root directly on top. In the case of our plastic uh, barrier that's in the central image, you can see that there are holes in that barrier to prevent it from trapping gases and floating back up to the surface. Uh, plants could grow through each of those holes that you see in that, that uh, plastic barrier. So of course, these are difficult to use in flowing systems because water flow is gonna pull on those uh, barriers as you're trying to lay them down. Uh, you may also have impacts on non-target organisms if you're laying these barriers directly on top of other species. Uh, the plastic-based barriers are generally going to be pretty non-selective and uh, kill what they're put right on top of, and other stuff typically is not going to start growing on top of them until there's sediment uh, deposited there. So I know my title slide said uh, successful strategies in the United States, but I thought it would be interesting to take a short visit down to New Zealand and look at some of the, the techniques that they're using there, and that this ties in with our benthic barriers. So on uh, Lake Wanaka in New Zealand, they have used uh, benthic barriers uh, successfully. Uh, so just as an introduction to the system, they did have to do uh, some widespread willow removal to get 
uh, uh, limbs and uh, logs and things of that nature up from the, the bed before they could start uh, laying the fabric down. Uh, so they implemented a containment program to try to reduce spread. Uh, and this is uh, lagrosiphon, which is uh, closely related to hydrilla. Uh, and a 200 meter weed bed was uh, controlled on the opposite side where willows had been removed. So in the image at the bottom left, this is what the bay looked like 15 years ago with uh, density of vegetation coming to the surface. And then right beside that's a 2019 image. Uh, to the right of that, we have our barrier, which is called Hessian lining. And then over time, they get native plant growth on top of that uh, barrier layer. So here's a couple more images of the, the bottom lining. Uh, the central uh, image, you see some lagrosiphon growing through some uh, holes in that barrier on the right. That's a picture from above water, but you can see a small gap that remain in between um, layers of that barrier. So where you have the barrier, you don't see any of the weed grow through it, but where you have a gap in the barrier, you see the uh, plants growing. So these were uh, laid by divers. Uh, anything below that typically is shaded out because of the fine weave of material. Uh, it's not practical for putting on top of tall weeds. Um, it just doesn't work as well on top of tall weeds. It needs to get closer to the sediment. Uh, not for exposed areas or uneven bottom or where propellers might hit it because that can all disturb or pull the, the barrier away. Uh, these barriers have worked very well for them in allowing native plants to grow through and being a natural fiber, it breaks down in 18 to 24 months. And so you see the two images there um, with the barrier serving its purpose. And then this is an image uh, from a nearby non-treated area and that shows the density of, of the lagrosiphon growth where there's no barrier and that growth is far more dense than what they would have with their native desirable species. And then uh, they were also kind enough to send a comparison of their uh, cost uh, per hectare for implementing the, the Hessian bottom, bottom lining and you can see that is a premium cost for that compared to some of the other common management techniques that would be done in New Zealand, suction dredging, harvesting, and then the herbicide options as we move down to the bottom of the slide. And they did not factor duration of control into the expense. Those are just the expense of implementing those techniques. Uh, so with that said, we'll move back to the United States and to uh, a biological control option, which is triploid grass carp. However, this is a different uh, type of biological control than what we would have from a host specific um, insect per se. So grass carp have been introduced from Asia. So they're a, a non-native species uh, with the, the wild type diploid grass carp. There is um, a high likelihood of them becoming invasive on their own. So diploid grass carp are typically an unwanted species in most states in the U.S. Uh, the triploid grass carp have been uh, shocked at an early stage to induce an extra set of chromosomes, so those are sterile fish and should not reproduce. Uh, grass carp are regulated on a state-by-state -state basis, so in some states uh, they're allowed to be stocked, other states they are not allowed to be stocked. Um, I like to tell people the good thing about triploid grass carp is that they eat submerged plants. The bad thing about tri triploid grass carp is that they eat submerged plants. So if you have native submerged plants in your system, grass carp are typically a terrible option. If you don't have native submerged plants in your system, but you do get something like hydrilla, grass carp can be a good option. So they can either be a very bad option or a good option depending on your system and what plant species you have in that system. Uh, there are some other concerns. Will they stay in the system? These are a riverine spe uh, species. They can swim a very long distance, so if they have an open inflow or an open outflow, you should expect uh, them to leave the system to some degree. Uh, what are the, the potential non-target impacts? Again, if you have native submerged species in your system, you should expect a high level of impact from triploid grass carp. So the, a very basic question when you're considering using grass carp is do you want submerged plants in the system? If you do, uh, grass carp are probably not the option for that system. If you don't have submerged plants, then grass carp might be a very good option. Uh, so again, grass carp regulation is at the state level. Uh, so some states like North Carolina allow stocking with a permit. Other states 
allow stocking with no permit needed. And in some states, you essentially can't stock them at all. Uh, it, again, it just depends on uh, which state you're in. And uh, a lot of the lake systems will determine that if you have natural lakes like glacial lakes up north or in Florida, grass carp are not as allowed typically as in the southeast where most of our water bodies are man-made impoundments. Uh, so grass carp have been used extensively for hydrilla management in the southeastern U.S. Um, hydrilla is very problematic in many of these reservoirs. Those reservoirs do not have many native plant species in them. So the neg potential negative impacts from grass carp are much more limited in, in those systems than in natural lakes. Once you release grass carp into a system, they're extremely difficult to get out. Uh, grass carp can live a long time. Some of them might live 20 or more years uh, in a system where they have ample vegetation. Natural mortality is going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 percent, depending on uh, how old they are and the, the type of habitat, but you don't lose a whole lot of grass carp to natural causes each year, so you can have grass carp persist quite a while. You can also have some potential impacts on water quality. Uh, submerged plants uh, will often benefit water quality if you remove uh, submerged plants by using grass carp, then that's going to have an impact. Uh, grass carp themselves might have some level of impact on water quality as well. So an example here is the Tar River Reservoir, which is in North Carolina. It's a drinking water system for the city of Rocky Mount. Uh, fluoridone was used to manage hydrilla in years one through five. And on the chart on the right, I don't want to overcomplicate this figure, but this is essentially the decrease in hydrilla tubers over time uh, based on the management that was implemented. So years one through five, uh, the uh, hydrilla infested area was treated each year with fluoridone. And that treatment was very successful in controlling all the biomass. And we saw a significant decrease in tuber density. Uh, so once we, in this system, once this system had had several years of effective management, it transitioned to a very low stocking rate of grass carp uh, to essentially serve as uh, more of a passive management technique for, from that point on. Uh, so the stocking rate of grass carp that was used in this system was 1.5 uh, triploid grass carp per hydrilla tuber bank acre. So what a hydrilla tuber bank acre is would be each acre of the reservoir that historically had hydrilla uh, established vegetation on it was assumed to, to have hydrilla tubers and grass carp were stocked based on that number. So our herbicide management with fluoridone had effectively uh, eliminated the biomass from the system, at least when the surveys were done. So rather than rely on a biomass estimate, uh, the stocking was based on uh, estimated tubers remaining in the system or the tuber banks that were infested. So it used a really low stocking rate of grass carp and complemented the herbicide technique that was used previously. And uh, I think that strategy has to date remained successful. One way you can monitor grass carp impact is with an exclosure or fencing. Uh, to some degree, you have to treat grass carp uh, kind of like livestock. So if you overstock them, they're going to eat everything. If you don't stock enough of them, you may not even know that they're in the system uh, if you have hydrilla and are trying to get rid of it. So within this exclosure at the top, you see we've got a lot of hydrilla. We also have a pond weed uh, with leaves at the surface. Outside of the exclosure where the grass carp are free to roam, you see no submersed vegetation at all. So that tells you that grass carp are having a big impact in this system. Uh, so moving on to our next management technique, uh, we have uh, drawdown. Uh, drawdowns can be effective on species that do not produce propagules like Agaria densa. Uh, you can impact, of course, non-target species. Uh, typically, this is not uh, an option in natural systems where you may not have the ability to draw it down. The image that you see there is a drawdown from Lake Gaston, so areas that are exposed uh, shoreline, you would have very good control of Agaria but the agaria that's remaining in the water is not going to be well controlled at all. Uh, host specific biocontrols are next. Uh, there are several host sp uh, specific biocontrols that have been developed for aquatic plants. Uh, these are, are great in the aspect that they have no non-target impacts when they're available. Uh, field efficacy typically is not as good as trials on these uh, insects when they're in controlled growth conditions such as a greenhouse or other enclosed environment. 
Uh, typically, uh, these uh, controls are more successful on emergent vegetation than they are on submerged vegetation. Overwintering tends to be a frequent limiting factor of uh, how far north uh, those species will establish. Uh, the image that you see here is a salvinia weevil, which is being uh, released for giant salvinia control in the southern United States. Uh, the other example I'll mention is the alligator weed flea beetle. This was the first insect study for aquatic weed biocontrol. It's been uh, very successful in warm climates throughout the southeast where the flea beetle will overwinter in uh, significant populations. It has done a very good job in controlling alligator weed and every life cycle of that organism does feed on alligator weed. Uh, so moving into herbicides, and unfortunately we'll have to speed up a little bit, I think. Um, so herbicides, uh, we've got several specific products that may be selective or non-selective to plants. Uh, usually these are plant-specific modes of action, meaning they don't target something in a fish or in waterfowl. It's just, uh, something more specific to plants. Herbicides can be used on a small scale or a large scale. In order to be registered as an aquatic herbicide, they cannot bioaccumulate, so that's one of the criteria that EPA will look at. And each of these products has to be registered by EPA and then also in the state in which it's to be used. So our first example uh, with successful herbicide implementation is the Eno River. So this is a 44 mile long uh, free flowing section of river. It eventually goes into Falls Lake, which is a drinking water reservoir. Uh, Eno River has exceptional water quality and also has numerous rare species, including the endangered panhandle pebble snail. And it also is a very popular uh, asset to the state park. So Hydrilla got into the system. If you look at the image at the bottom right, uh, this did raise concern about impacts to those native species in the system due to the density that Hydrilla was uh, attaining. So in order to develop a management program, there were years and years of meetings uh, to establish the protocol moving forward and what would happen. Uh, there was background research that was done in order to justify and, and be sure that uh, no harm would be caused by the management technique. Uh, riffle weed uh, that you see on the right is a primary native plant. It serves as habitat for the panhandle pebble snail. So one thing that could not happen with a management program would have been any type of negative impact to riffle weed. Uh, potential herbicide impacts to non-plant species were also evaluated before management was implemented. Uh, there was a small grass carp tagging and monitoring uh, study that was done, and a lot of river surveys were done. Uh, leading up to this again, attempted hand removal failed. Uh, spot herbicide application was also not successful, and hydrilla management was implemented in near nearby impoundments to reduce the likelihood of fragments coming back into the river system. Uh, this is just some of the background research that was done leading up to the management program. Uh, a pilot study was implemented, so this was intended to be the first two years of management as a pilot study to be sure that the techniques uh, would fit the goal uh, before it moved to what would be termed an operational uh, treatment. So the, the, the goal was simply uh, to reduce hydrilla biomass in the target area and cause no significant impact to non-target species. Uh, so objectives determine effectiveness of controlling hydrilla, and the Eno River does have a lot of variability in flow, so that was one uh, thing that had to be worked through, and a large degree of monitoring of non-target species. Uh, so success will be defined by reduction in hydrilla biomass, and a, a reduction of hydrilla turion levels would have been even uh, better as a measurement of success. And then the future steps will be determined based on uh, how the pilot study went. So uh, in this uh, image, we've got areas in red that had confirmed hydrilla, which includes sections of the Eno River and also some impoundments above uh, the section that runs through the state park. If you see the two yellow triangles, that would be the start and stop point for the treatment, which is essentially uh, right before and right after the long red section of river that you see. Uh, there are a bunch of monitoring studies that were done. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but you can see um, plants, fish, mussels were all surveyed to monitor uh, potential impacts. Uh, treatment inside um, that white container is a tank containing herbicide, also a meter application device so that herbicide will be trickled out through a line. This was all hooked up to uh, uh, technology connected through uh, cell towers so it could be controlled remotely. Uh, 
and it could be controlled based on the volume of water that was flowing through the Eno River. So uh, herbicide could be turned up or down depending on flow. So everything was essentially monitored uh, at each uh, moment in time. Uh, just a quick overview of treatment history. In 2015 was the first year of the demonstration program. Uh, 2019, uh, the herbicides were again repeated. I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but uh, multiple years of herbicide treatment, and we successfully reduced the, the amount of hydrilla in that system. Uh, here's an image from 2011 and 2016 that uh, the pleasant green section, so you can see the hydrilla biomass present before management, and essentially no hydrilla in that river section in 2016. The native desirable riffle weed was not harmed uh, by any measurement um, that was done. It's still in the system at the same level as before. Uh, here's another section of river uh, near the town of Hillsborough before and after treatment. So in conclusion, uh, with that project, hydrilla was successfully controlled. There are not plans to treat in 2020 because there hasn't been uh, biomass in that system for a couple of years now. Uh, no negative impacts in non-plants were observed. Uh, there was a small transient um, effect to American water willow, which was some chlorosis observed, but that was only on a very limited time. It only happened in a single year, but no uh, negative impact to riffleweed, no other impact to water willow was observed. Uh, the treatment was moved upstream from that original pilot study, uh, but again, has been successful to the point that there won't be a treatment done in 2020. So one more project that I'll mention real quickly in an end. Uh, this was a treatment of the Erie Canal, which is a very interesting uh, treatment scenario. Uh, these slides are courtesy of Mike Netherland and, and Dean Jones. Uh, so hydrilla was identified along a 15 mile stretch of the Erie Canal. And this is a really interesting system because being a canal, it connects other water bodies to each other. So if you have hydrilla in the Erie Canal, it can go to a lot of different places and that's a big concern. Obviously you wanna keep it out of as many of those natural lakes and other systems that, that you can in that region. So in 2014, each of these dots shows some level of hydrilla population through that section of the Erie Canal. Uh, the dark blue would be a heavy density of hydrilla. Those beds uh, were surveyed and delineated so that management program could be established. Um, flow rates are highly variable in the Erie Canal. Summer flow can be between 500 and 1,000 CFS, and flow in the canal actually goes in a different direction depending on the season. Uh, so again, it's a very unique system uh, and had a lot of challenges for management. Um, so endothol in the form of aquathol was selected for control of hydrilla in this system uh, because of the short exposure time that the flow allowed. Uh, there was a very short period in which the herbicide had to work. Uh, there were no restrictions on fishing, swimming, recreation, or irrigation. Uh, the herbicide selected was compatible for a uh, native plant ballast scenario that was intended to be maintained. And this herbicide had also been used for hydrilla management programs in other places in the U.S. Uh, so endothol was applied uh, across a multiple year uh, treatment scenario. And in 2019, these were the points within the canal that had hydrilla. So very few points where hydrilla remained. If you want to compare that again to 2014, a few years before where it was far more widespread, the treatment was successful in greatly reducing uh, the distribution of hydrilla in that system. Uh, this chart just shows other species than hydrilla, so you can see that other species, other plant species remained in the, the treated area within that system. Uh, and just a quick summary here, hydrilla frequency was reduced by 98%. So I apologize for going so quickly through uh, the Erie Canal, but I'm running short on time and I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, so the Erie Canal did have a lot of different partners and I want to mention or put this slide up to show all the different partners that were involved with the Erie Canal project. Uh, so finally, just to summarize everything in this presentation, you know, a, a formal decision-making plan is beneficial and needed, especially in complicated systems. Uh, vegetation surveys are essential for understanding systems and for monitoring management efforts. Multiple management techniques are available, but the best tool is really going to depend on the system that you're talking about, the parameters of that system, human involvement and plant biology. 
and management techniques must be designed to not only remove weeds but interfere with reproduction and population sustainability. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. I would like to thank uh, Dan Clements and Paul Champion for the information from New Zealand. Uh, Rob Emmons at North Carolina, Carolina DEQ runs the call share program uh, that implements most of the aquatic weed uh, management treatments in North Carolina. Uh, the Erie Canal Project, Mike Netherland and Dean Jones uh, were very instrumental in that project. And I'd also like to thank the Aquatic Plant Management Society and WSSA, Weed Science Society of America, for uh, supporting this webinar. Excellent. Thanks, Rob, for that uh, really thorough presentation. We do have time for a few questions, so let's pop over there and um, let's see. The first question is um, clarification on, you used the phrase, should not reproduce. Um, and this person asks, is there a potential for a percent of reproduction or sorry, reversion in the wild, even a few fertile ones could be dangerous? Yes, with regard to uh, grass carp. So my understanding is that the triploid grass carp are sterile, but the process uh, that shocks those cells to induce the extra set of chromosomes is not 100% for each um, set of eggs that would go through there. So each of those uh, then sterile or triploid fish that comes out of that process is supposed to be blood tested to verify that they are triploid. Uh, so that, that testing can be different in each state, uh, but many states that allow triploid grass carp to be stocked will require that each fish uh, be tested or that a subset of fish be tested. So hopefully that answers your question. Great. Um, next question is, uh, are there any recommendations for tidal wetland hydrilla control? For example, this person sounds like they're in the Connecticut River estuary. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So typically we have fewer management options once you move into tidal areas or estuarine systems. Uh, most of our management options are for freshwater systems. Um, so unfortunately, um, you know, I can't give a quick, uh, good answer to that question, uh, but if you'd like to contact me for more information, I'd be happy to discuss that. Uh, Connecticut does have an ongoing um, program for the Connecticut River, so there may be some resources uh, locally that I can link you to as well. Great. Couple more questions. Um, could you clarify again what, you're mean, what you mean by ground truthing and machine learning? Yeah, so I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, explain some of that well enough. With ground truthing, if you're doing remote sensing of any type with a sensor, whether it be a hydroacoustic a sonar unit or a satellite imagery, uh, you need to do some level of ground truthing, which will be physically going out to individual points and verifying the species that you have there. So there are a lot of remote sensing options available that you can do from a distance, uh, such as simply looking at a satellite image from your computer, uh, but you have to do some level of ground truthing to verify the species that are there. Uh, so, and then moving to machine learning, that's a newer, um, uh, say, technology, if you will, but uh, it's a way of, of processing data or sensing technology to predict what's there, essentially. Uh, so machine learning is a newer technology, um, not really uh, implemented right yet in the field, uh, but it's one that some researchers are working on and it may be more commonplace in the future. Great. Um, here's a question. Uh, do you, how do you deal with people who are opposed to one of the tools in your aquatic weed management toolbox, such as herbicides? Right, yeah, that's another great, great question. And typically in any large system, you're gonna have people that are opposed. And then if you switch to a different technique, then you're just gonna to switch to a different set of your stakeholders that are opposed. Um, the only way to really address that is with a very thorough uh, process of developing your management strategy. So you have to select techniques that you can defend by science. Um, you're still not gonna convince everybody that everybody out there that what you're doing is the right thing to do. But over time, if your program is successful, uh, they will become convinced that the, the management strategy is working. So in the case of the Eno River, which I mentioned, uh, the first public meeting for the Eno River had somewhere around 100 people that showed up with various concerns about using herbicides in the Eno River. So uh, their questions were answered and all the science that went into developing the management program was explained to them. 
So two years later, there was another public meeting, and I forget the number, but we'll say somewhere around 12 people showed up, largely because most of the concerns have been alleviated by the success of the program. Uh, there were fewer concerns, so it wasn't worth people's time to show up. And then another public meeting two years later, the number of people that showed up was around three or four. So very few people showed up and most of the concerns had been eliminated just by explanation of the program, uh, verification that it was working through the monitoring and dissemination of that, that information to the public. Great. Fantastic. Uh, we've got time for one more question. If anyone wants to type that in your question box here, I'll give folks a couple seconds. <laughs> Uh, for the Eno River, what metric was used to determine when non-nuisance levels of hydrilla was reached? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And in, in the Eno River in particular, there wasn't a, a set definition at the beginning of management. So there were a lot of unknowns when that project was started. So the, the, the initial goal of the project or the pilot study was just to reduce the biomass that was out there. So as the program went along each year, uh, there was less and less biomass that was found. So that project never specifically stated an, a, a certain amount that would be labeled successful, uh, but each year essentially found less and less biomass. So that was used to verify that the, the project was working. Now in other systems, you might, it might be better to define a, a specific amount or a threshold that you would cross, whether that, is important or is good for that system. Again, it's just going to depend on the specific parameters of that system and uh, stakeholders and all of your agency involvement. But that could be a good thing to include, or it may not be necessary, just depending on, on your individual system. Excellent. And uh, let's see, one more question. Is that adequate funding for aquatic plant management research? Um, if not, who do you think should pay for it? Well, that's uh, <laughs> being an aquatic plant management researcher, you know, the first reaction is going to be that there's never enough funding for it, but um, funding is going to differ state by state and can differ nationally from year to year. Um, overall, there are not enough funds invested in aquatic plant management research, but you could say the same for some other areas of invasive species, uh, species research as well. Um, in a lot of states, there just is not a set pool of money for, for managing these systems. So many states just don't have the resources to implement management. Um, other states uh, might make it a little bit more easy to develop the, the funds to do that. Uh, so a lot of it depends on a state by state in terms of implementing management. Um, and funding can come from a variety of different places. But I think you know the, the shortest answer to that question is that uh, it would benefit us all to develop better funding mechanisms for the research that goes into this, as well as for the implementation of those management programs. Excellent. And with that, we are at our hour mark. Um, I want to thank you again, Rob, for this fantastic presentation. And uh, again, thank our sponsors of uh, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar series and uh, NISA events overall. Um, the University of Georgia Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health, the Weed Science Society of America, uh, and the Wyoming Weed and Pest Council, and the host organization, and the North American Invasive Species Management Association, um, which relies on the support of its members to put on uh, webinars and other events uh, like this. So again, thanks everyone for uh, participating today, taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, this webinar was recorded and again will be posted on NASMA's YouTube channel, so you're welcome to hop over there. It should be posted by tomorrow. Um, feel free to forward that link to any of your colleagues you think might be interested in this information. Um, and with that, thanks again, Rob, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.